Welcome to this video about scripting with Lysum. Today we're going to talk about how to manipulate, edit and work with geodata with the Lysum software. Let's start by looking a bit at the interface. As you can see, there are two main windows. On the left here, we have the data viewer and on the right, we have the user interface where you can actually control and manipulate all the data. So if we go to the script tab, we can see there's two main ways that we can actually interact with the data. The first one is the command line tool, which is on the bottom right. And the second one is the script editor here in the middle. The script editor allows you to do more extensive, more, have more granular control about the, the operations you want to do. And the command line tool is an easy way to, to do some quick, dirty calculations with data. Okay, so our first example. Let's uh, start out by making sure that the license software can actually find all of the data that we want. I have all of my geo data in a folder called geo. So I will select it and then I press the set working directory button to make sure that license considers this folder our current working directory. Now license will be able to find all the files that are inside it. Uh, currently in this folder, I have a file called dm.tiff. So let's have a look. I scroll to it, I double click, and it automatically opens the data and then zooms to the right location. So this data is elevation data for a part of the Caribbean island Dominica. And as it is elevation data, it makes sense to look at it as a hill shaded relief, which simulates the lighting of sunlight that uh, comes on the terrain and shows us the channels and the valleys in the region. Let's say we want to do some simple calculation with this data. So let's say we calculate the slope. Oh, I've entered a statement here. There's this function available called slope. It takes as an argument the handle tiff, which is the file. Lysum automatically knows where it is and what it is, and it will load it in an appropriate way. And I will save it to slope.map. If I press enter, the script says it's done. And if I go to slope.map and double click, I can see that the slope values are now stored in this data set. So conversion of data types, as you might have seen already, has never been easier. We can simply load a file and save it under a different name and also a different format. I can store a TIFF file as another TIFF file, but I can also store a TIFF file as a map file. And many other formats are supported. All the supported file types that can be written, read, and viewed are actually supported by GDAL, which is the library that's used internally to do the, the reading and writing. Let's look at a second and a bit more complicated example. We will calculate the wetness index. So the wetness index is a little bit more involved, but it should be easy to follow along. For this first, we need to calculate the drainage network. And this we can do with the drainage network function, which converts an elevation model, which we have, into a local drainage direction network. I'm going to press enter. In the meantime, since I already did this beforehand, oh, it's actually done. You can double click and open the map. And it shows you the actual network that it calculated. So these are the flow paths that it estimated for water based on local drainage directions. The second thing we then need to calculate is the flow accumulation. So this map gives you the answer of how much area flows through each specific pixel. Again, there's a function implemented in license to do just this, called AccuFlux. So we can input the local drainage direction map and use an argument of one to indicate if you want to calculate for each surface area, one material to flow through the network. And we're going to store this as AccuFlux.map. Opening this, we can see that the flow patterns throughout the area are filled with, with flux. Um, in the meantime, if we change this to a logarithmic scale, we can see a little bit better the patterns, especially in areas with uh, lower flow accumulation. From here, we can do the final wetness index calculation. So the wetness index of map, is the logarithm of the flow accumulation divided by the a tangent of the slope. Pressing enter, it will calculate. And we now have our wetness index of map. At the moment, we did some division by zero, which means that some of the pixels have incorrect values. 
if we manually zoom to the specific values of interest, we can see that the wetness index itself was okay. To fix this issue, we can put a minimum value on the slope, say max 0 0.01, which is a very small slope, and slope to fit. And if you perform the calculation like this, we don't have any errors in the calculation, and instead can directly see the, the relevant values. Now, there are some things to keep in mind with all of these calculations. Most of the algorithms and calculations assume that you're working with data that has identical uh, map size, identical extent, and the same number of rows and columns. This is not always the case. There are functions that do raster warping and raster reprojection, but most of the functions and calculations assume this is the case. If not, you will get an error during your script running. Now, Lysim also overrides data without request, so be sure to save the data that you need for reuse later on. In any case, the command line tool allows you to see past uh, commands and you can scroll through them with the arrow key. So in addition to the autocomplete functionality in the script, which allows you to find functions and see their descriptions like so. So here for the drainage network, I can see all the functions that start with this name, what they do. There's also the toolbox. The toolbox allows you to search also in all the functions that are available, see a short description and what input and output they need. So here for the drainage network function, the one that we use is this one. It takes a map, the elevation model, and it returns a map, which is the local drainage network. In addition to single band raster data, so where each pixel contains one value, Lysenk can also work with multi-band, so spectral raster data. Here I have an example, Sentinel data uh, with eight bands. Let's see, if I double click on this file and I zoom to extent, we can see that it's a, a, an imagery of a, of a town somewhere in a, a forested area. So let's say we want to calculate the NDVI. Well, we can do that. And in our calculation, we can access the different bands using the bracket index operator. So bands three and two are the infrared and the red bands that we need to calculate the NDVI. And by doing so and double clicking on NDVI.tip, we can actually visualize the result and see that we have calculated the NDVI correctly. Now, by default, reading a map takes the first band in the file. If instead you want to work with all the bands as a list, you can use the all bands command. So if I say all bands, it gives me a list of all of the maps in the file. And if I save that as another file, I have a copy of the original spectral data. So if I now double click on copy tiff, I open copy of the original uh, multispectral data. The syntax of, of the scripting also allows us to reorder files very easily. So let's say we want to create a false color composite with the green, blue, and infrared bands. So we will call that lancelot false.tiff. We will make a new list using the curly brackets and then have the first, second, and third band of the file, and then close the list with the closing curly bracket. Within Lysim, index operators for list start counting at zero, just like they would in C or C++ or similar languages. So double-clicking on Lancet false shows us the false color composite where we can see the vegetation presence highlighted as blue. Lysim also supports many algorithms for multispectral data, such as classification, unsupervised or supervised. In this case, we can do a classification unsupervised using the k-means algorithm on the first five bands of the Landsat data. So when I run this classification algorithm, it will start to work. This will take a while. Um, oh, well, that's faster than I thought. It's done. And as you can see, the k-means algorithm classified the data for us. Table data is also supported in Lysum. I have a short example here, uh, which is table data for land use types. So if I double click on land use table, I get a table viewer and I can see that each of the rows here is a land use land cover combination. 
lakes, quarries, airports, etc. And each column is a specific property. Many surface roughness, vegetation height, random roughness, canopy height, etc. Now we can combine the land use table, so the properties, and a land use map to generate a map that contains properties from the table. So this is a land use map where each of the land use classes have a specific number, and those numbers coincide with the column from this table. Now, if I, for example, want to make a Mannings N surface roughness the coefficient map, I can use the function raster from table to provide the table, then my column number, which is the land use dot map. So the class within that map provides the column number that I want to use when looking up a value. And then for the row number, I use a constant map where everything is zero. And the reason to do this, of course, is that Mannings surface roughness coefficient is in the zero indexed column. Um, the zero column. So running this and it's done, we can see we now have a Manning surface roughness coefficient map based on the land use map and the table. Well, perhaps another example of data you can work with is vector data. So let's take some time and actually show some vector data. I'm going to clean up my viewing window, some of the data that was already there. Open up the elevation data, it's a hill shade and then open the shape file. So again, Lysim internally used GDAL to read, load, and, and write some of these, uh, these file types. Now, it's opened this. This is all done on the GPU, which makes scrolling, zooming in, zooming out quite fast. Loading takes a little bit more time because it has to transfer the data to the GPU. I'm going to style this data to give it a little bit more contrast to the background. So my polygon outline I will make. Uh, red. So these are uh, an overview of landslides, flash floods, debris flows that occurred during Hurricane Maria in 2017 on the Caribbean island Dominica. Now, what can we do with this vector data? Let's say we want to have a look at the attributes. We can export the attributes to a table. So I copy the code here. We say attribute of table is equal to shapefile dot get layer zero, so get the first layer in the file, dot get all attributes. And by doing so, it will export all those attributes to a file called attributes.table. And if I double click on this, you see that all the attributes for the shape and all the features in the file are there. You can also set and edit attributes directly from the scripting language. A final thing we might want to do is rasterize the data, so convert the vector data to a map. Again, there's a function for this in the Lysen language, and it's called rasterize. We provide a specific empty map for this to put the data into, a reference map, then the shape file. We provide no attribute name because I don't want to put an attribute in the map at the moment. Instead, I want to burn in a value, which I specify by the value true, and then the burn in value, which is one. And I'm saving that all as inventory.tiff. So it's done, and we can have a look at the data itself. Inventory.tiff is here. And we see that it rasterized successfully and put the value 1 in those places where the inventory was present. Now, there's some other types of data that Lysim can work with and analyze. Some examples are uh, objects data, so 3D meshes, for which it uses the ASIMP library to, to load and write them. So if I open a mesh here and zoom to extent and go to the 3D view, we see that we have a, oh, so this is a marching cubes uh, shape from a 3D fluid simulation highlighted within, uh, within Lightning. We can add a little bit more of a, of a background to see what is up and what is down and where our sun is coming from. Other types of data we can work with are 3D fields. And fields are an extension of um, rasters, but then in 3D, so volumetric pixel data. So if I open one of these, this is the velocity component of a similar 3D fluid simulation. And I will change the color scale a little bit so we can see some interesting 3D patterns. 
So at the moment, green is positive velocity, red is negative velocity in the z direction. And I will make the zero velocity transparent. And you see, we do a, a 3D ray marching uh, to do volumetric display of the data. And we can fly through it and see all the intricacies of the 3D data set. And finally, Lysimulsio allows also allows you to work with point cloud data. So, so far, you've worked mostly with the command line tool. And this can be very useful, particularly if you want to do very quick calculations using files that are available. However, there's also the scripting tool. And here, you can have much more granular control and express much more complex ideas for geodata. Let us show an example of this. So, we make a new script by pressing the New button. As you can see, the new script is not empty. Instead, there is void, main, opening brackets, closing brackets, and then opening curly brackets and closing curly brackets. This is a function. And the function void main is actually what's called the entry point of the script. So the entry point is that function where it's called when you start the script. And when the function is done, the script is done. So I'm going to save the script. And I see it already exists which it warns me, so I'm going to save it under another name. So void main, what can we do? Well, it wouldn't be much of a tutorial if it, it wouldn't be much of a tutorial if we didn't do a hello world example. So let's do a hello world example. First, I'm going to put a comment to describe a little bit what we do. And then we print the text. Hello world. And we save, and I run it, and we see it printed hello world, and then it said it was done. Now, instead of just printing out some pointless text, we can also do some actual editing of geodata. And one example of this is having more pixel-based control of your calculations. So the following script actually takes a map and replaces each value with the column plus the row index of that specific pixel. So let's look at how that works. First, we load a map. And we load that map into a variable called DEM. Now, this map now exists in memory. And it is named DEM. So the script now knows if I talk about DEM, it's talking about this variable. And any changes to it are only stored in that variable in memory and no longer to the disk. If we want to save the edit additions we make, we have to save that file also to the disk. And we do that in the line 16, where we say DEM will be stored in desktop diff. Here we have two loops, nested loops, where we actually go over each of the pixels. So we, R goes from zero to the number of rows, and C goes from zero to the number of columns. And we replace each value in the map with the row number plus the column number. Well, this is about a million pixels in this map. We run it, it's done, it's quite fast. And let's open the map and have a look at it. And if we press the layer and use the shift button to expect the values, we can see that the values increases from the top left to the bottom right. So this is some more pixel-based calculations you can do within Lysim. I want to thank you for watching this tutorial. If you have any questions about the Lysim software and want to know more, you can always visit our website, www.lysimmobile.com, and you can contact us personally through our email address, which is on the website. Thank you very much.